Hey, everybody. Been started yet. Some people are just coming in. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Hi, Diane. Hi, Nate. How are you? Hello. Would you like to introduce yourself and let us know uh, what interests you about tonight? Dave in Tacoma here. Looks interesting. I'm a retired engineer and I kind of interested in philosophy, psychology, and uh, learning, things like that. So I thought I'd drop in some free time this afternoon. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I apologize. I just introduced myself. I'm Diane Bush. Um, I attended St. John's. So um, I had some free time today and this looked interesting. So here I am. Great. Welcome. Both Dave and Diane. Do you all know about critical thinking skills? Have you tried them? I have not been educated on what a critical thinking skill is, but I think idealistic, that may be a, a thing I try to do, but I will be interested to learn more about it. Could you repeat your question? I was just asking if you're familiar with critical thinking skills and if you're using them. Certainly, in everyday life. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Shauna. Hello. Hi, everybody. Would you like to introduce yourselves and uh, say um, what interests you about tonight's topic? I'm not really even sure what tonight's topic is. Oh, we'll be discussing critical thinking skills. Um, I'm just trying to learn new stuff. Oh, well, you're in the right place. Um, we do different topics every week. We welcome you. Thank you. Um, I'm in New Jersey. Great. I'm in New Jersey, too. I'm in North Jersey. I'm in South Jersey, Atlantic City. Cool. Hi, Trevor. Hi, Anna. Hi, Daniel. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well, how are you doing? Oh, very well, thank you. Uh, this is Daniel, I don't think you've been here before. Is this your first time? I've kind of come in every here and there. I'm not very consistent, no. So it wouldn't be a surprise, I think, to many if they don't recognize me, but I've kind of popped in every here and there. So I've been involved in maybe two or three discussions. Oh, that's nice. Do you know about critical thinking skills? Possibly. <laughs> Depending on how we define it, it's a, it's quite a nebulous concept, I'd have to say. 
at least from how from my standpoint at the very least i'm not quite sure how one might begin to try and outline what critical thinking skills are other than that it seems to be in some in some way a, a kind of mode of mental activity in which individuals try and more or less see the underlying maybe connections between certain notions and distinctions that might arise between specific concepts like justice equality fairness as an as a case example for so yeah yeah just, just to summarize yeah um to some extent i guess i'm familiar with critical thinking but i'm more interested to see what other people have to say about it oh, well you're in the oh, right well place. you're in the right place <laughs> thank you and how about your guys selves uh what's your background with respect to critical thinking I think Garrett has more of a background than I do. <laughs> so the, it's a large topic and that's why it's gonna be a multi-event multi, multi -event, uh, topic. Tonight we're just talking about sort of what are critical thinking skills and then we're gonna have multiple subsequent events where we're gonna talk about um, different ways to improve our critical thinking skills. Just talking about what they are as a bunch of you are alluding to is a difficult challenge and so um, I'll make my best effort, and I'm taking from a variety of sources, uh, some of which is, um, you know, from my own um, thinking about it, and then and then some from other sources as well. Yeah, and critical thinking has a long history as well. Um, it's kind of been a, an idea or an activity, if you will, that's evolved over time, especially if you look at the way that critical thinking has existed in the day of some of the ancient Greeks. And then up until the Enlightenment with Francis Bacon sort of introducing the quote unquote modern day conception of the scientific method, I feel like those have a, a keen relationship with respect to critical thinking. And also just, you know, there's in kind of how you described it, there's thinking about critical thinking as a concept, as a kind of abstract idea. And then there also are um, conversations that can be had about how do we improve critical thinking and what are some of the things that are involved when it comes to critical thinking like maybe text analysis for example or when you're um, analyzing arguments that people are making so there's there are some concrete uses that you can make of when i when you think about critical thinking i think <laughs> i've said thinking like three times in that last sentence <laughs> That sounds good. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves? I see some uh, different names here. I see Richard, Mike, Kevin, Kelly, Gary, Emma, Diane. Um, you all are welcome to introduce yourselves. Uh, Jean is here also. So my name is Kelly from New Jersey. Uh, what we are talking about, I'm sorry, I'm, I was late. Oh, we're talking about critical thinking skills tonight. It's a first of a series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everyone speaking? Nope, we're letting people introduce themselves right now, so feel free. Hi. I'm Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah. Um, pronouns he, him, his. Until the land near um, Vancouver, Canada. Um, I think this is one of my first times to this group, but, but I've been popping in and out of the Seattle philosophy groups from time and time again, and they've been connected with the one down in Australia. So just to see here what's what you're about. Um, I noticed you were on YouTube as well. I've listened to bits and pieces of that. So cool. Welcome. That's a bit of one. Yeah, thank you. Hi. I'm, I'm Gene Hammond, Gene Hammond, I'm uh, on Long Island. 
I've written a book called Critical Thinking. <laughs> uh, so, but I think I think it comes down to a very simple concept, and that is the difference between facts and inferences. And uh, most people, I think, mistake inferences for facts. They say, "Well, uh, let's see, Max Max Scherzer, for example, is a cheater," uh, and they think that's a fact, but it's not really a fact. It's an inference based on some behavior something like that. Uh, and, and when people can distinguish between the inferences we all draw from facts and the facts themselves, then I think they're on their way to be good critical thinkers. Thank you, Dean. Um, if you're interested, I know you've attended a few times, you're welcome to co-host an event, maybe something about critical thinking, because we'll be having more events on that topic. So you're welcome to reach out. Yeah, Gene, reach out to me if you want to, you know, teach a little bit on critical thinking, like how to improve critical thinking skills specifically, or what our future critical uh -huh. thinking events are going to be about. So if you're interested in that, definitely reach out to me. I would be interested. I, I like the idea that this is an open group, and there are no so-called experts that are more expert than others. But uh... yeah, I'm going to present stuff, but the it is an open group. Like I'll present stuff, and we we have a philosophy being free thinkers that everyone's allowed to accept and reject whatever they their own judgment comes to the conclusion of. So I'm going to mm -hmm. give a bunch of suggestions. Your book, I'm sure, has a bunch of suggestions, and ultimately, all this world is full of is people who have a bunch of suggestions, even if they think <laughs> their facts are the only facts and the only reality. Um, those are usually the people that are a little too attached to their own ideas. Um, you know, it's better, I think, to let everyone come to their own conclusions, which is part of what I think critical thinking is, is coming to your own conclusions. But I'll get to that in a minute. Mm, nicely done. Thank you. Who else wants to introduce themselves? Can I start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Steve. I uh, live in uh, Queens, New York. Um, I I participated once or twice uh, with F FDI. Um, I was uh, part of a meetup group called Street Philosophers 101. Uh, it's actually based in Australia. And uh, the um, organizer dropped out. And I got kind of talked into taking it over temporarily and it, uh, other than the extreme time zone difference, I'm just trying to get them to talk about these topics. That was me, Steve. That was my group that I started. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're... Um... It's me. You can abuse me. I'm Will. Hi. Sorry. Oh, hi, Will. Uh, very good. Yeah. Uh, actually, I... I still haven't figured out how to get meet up to to switch the 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 time system. Um, what I'm thinking of is doing a, one more attempt at a at, at a conversation with the group, and um, uh, pick the subject of uh, AI and CG, uh, CGT uh, uh, and the um, chatbots and how that's making what was already a difficult. Uh, problem of, of determining reality and how to discuss truth, make it a, making it supercharged and perhaps worse, or maybe uh, using technology to make things better. But the uh, what are the tools? The question is, what are the tools that philosophy gives us that anyone could possibly use to, uh, to analyze uh, assertions or um, uh, ideas that people are that are thrown out and uh, analyze them. Um, and we've got the examples of uh, the early philosophy of, uh, of besides Bacon that was mentioned, the scientific method from the uh, from the Enlightenment. We have uh, we have Socrates basically questioning questioning uh, uh, people's closely held beliefs and keep on questioning them. Keep on, the, the, but of course that. You know that that sort of can antagonize people, and and he of course ended badly because of that. Uh, you have the ideas of Aristotle of the logical fallacies, 
But my concern with that is people learn the logical fallacies, fallacies in order to break them. Um, in other words, a, a good re rhetorician uh, learns all of them and then says, these are powerful tools I can use to shut down my opponent. Um, uh, people like Cicero were very powerful, uh, very persuasive, but uh, they'd learned all of these as logical fallacies, but they went ahead to attack their opponent's personalities, uh, to um, use circular reasoning, to um, to appeal to emotions, uh, to appeal to authority. You know, the gods say we must do this, therefore you must do what I say. Um, and, uh, and and therefore, just learning what the logical fallacies are is not uh, not a solution. Um, so uh, I I was taken with uh, one group called schoolofthought.org. Um, they have a list of ideas of um, uh, if people will agree to what they call the rules of civic uh, conversation, they post these rules and say, if you agree to these rules, then we can have a civil conversation, even if we strongly disagree with each other, and maybe we can come to some uh, some conclusions and uh, make some progress. Um, but the problem is you have to know what those rules are, and then you have to get all the parties to agree. Um, so, That's great, Stephen. Um, I think you can also keep in touch with us uh, if you'd like to co-host an event. Um, you have a lot of knowledge. Oh, very on good. I will do so. Yeah. Uh, to FTI, me, uh, right? Message. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, do do people have some other besides the obvious ones, Socrates, uh, uh, the three sieves and things like that? Do people have ideas of what are some easy things that we can teach people that they can they can uh, tools that people can use in all of the different uh, things that they that get thrown at them to uh, to analyze them. So, and I'll mute myself. Um, this is Kelly. I want to make one comment about critical thinking. You know, skills. It sounds very you know profound and needs very special, it sounds like it needs very special skill, but, you know, if we ask ourselves, you know, why, you know, why should we, you know, buy that idea? Why should we buy the someone said what, you know? So if we keep thinking about, think, you know, keep asking to ourselves why, then we can really increase, you know, their skill and, so, you know, why is, I think it's very important to develop the critical thinking. I agree with you completely. I think it's super important, especially in this day and age. Um, anyone else wanna um, give a quick introduction before we get started? All right, then uh, let me just pull up my. Uh, if there's anyone else, feel free to feel free to go. I'm just gonna pull up my notes. Right. So. Um, Welcome everybody tonight. We're gonna to kind of kick things off. Thanks uh, for participating in the social to those who participated and for those who didn't, we would love you to participate next time and uh, introduce yourselves. So to introduce myself, my name is Garrett Lang. I'm a software developer turned software inventor, now an entrepreneur. My hobby is writing and discussing practical philosophy. And I'm also the executive director of the Freethinker Institute, which is the organization that brings you tonight's event. Um, and we are a not-for-profit looking to support and empower members. Uh, we really want to help people be the best version of themselves, seek truth, and to be fair through transformational personal and professional development. We have free events like this one every Tuesday evening covering a wide range of topics not typically covered in academia or industry. And we also have weekly members-only events, which um, if you want to learn more about, uh, I'll make a few mentions of uh, in, uh, in tonight's discussion. And Ellis will post more information about our members-only events, um, which you have to apply to be a member. 
Um, and that's basically to apply practical wisdom into our daily lives. Um, we have only one rule in the Freethinker Institute, and that is to remain polite. That keeps us all in the logical portion of our brain rather than uh, making emotional comments and discussions and or decisions. Um, and so um, I just recommend everyone keep uh, keep calm and um, you know remain polite throughout the the evening. And we have much better discussions that way. People are usually really good about that, but I do like to mention it up front. If someone's not polite, then we warn them, and if they continue to be impolite, then they get removed. So. Uh, we do moderate that one rule strictly, but it's our only rule, so it is important to keep it uh, keep it in line. So um, I also like to recommend everybody do what we call listening to understand, which is to listen to other people's perspective and try to understand it uh, with an open mind. Um, we learn a lot more from listening to other people and asking them why they think what they think. And I'll also mention uh, we have a, a quick thing that we do, um, and I also have three monitors, so I'm going to be kind of looking in all different directions. But um, we we also have a thing that we do, like if you want to make a quick comment, like uh, after the presentation, we hold questions until after the presentation. But then um, after the presentation, um, people are welcome to raise hands and um, you can raise them during the presentation, but you'll be you know called on after the presentation. And then um, the, um, the, uh, the idea is that um, we keep each comment or question to one comment or question at a time. Um, so that we can keep you know rotating through comments and questions. And if you have something that you want to respond to uh, what someone said, you'll use the reaction with the little party hat, and that'll be a sign that you want to the, the one right there that uh, I think uh, Ellis just did. And so if you do that little party hat reaction, that means that you want to respond to what someone just said. Normally, what happens is someone will make a comment and then I'll reflect on that and sort of share thoughts on it. Um, but if someone else wants to share their thoughts on um, what the person just said, just put the party hat up and we'll give you a chance to speak as well. Um, but that just lets us continue the conversation through you know, each person's topic, but make sure that everybody feels heard and acknowledged and listened to um, by uh, either myself or the community or both. So um, with that said, um, I'm going to uh, set up my presentation mode. Okay. And you should be able to see my screen now. So what are critical thinking skills and how do we get them? We're going to do less about how do we get them. We're going to talk more about what they are and what they're not a little bit um, about what they're not. Um, and so I. Uh, and I just said my head to jump to the next uh, slide. So. There are sort of two main goals. I'm gonna. I like to talk about goals. Like, what do, what are, what is the purpose of critical thinking? Like, what are, what are we trying to accomplish with critical thinking skills? And so, the first thing that I think we're trying to accomplish is knowledge acquisition. And what that means is telling fact from fiction. You know, what's real? We live at a time that fake news travels faster than real news. Believe it or not. And uh, because of that, it's really important to be able to tell fact from fiction. And it is not easy. There's a lot of smart people that get it wrong and have um, fallen prey to misinformation. Um, and um, it, it's you know, very important. And that's part of why I think critical thinking skills are so important because we live in this time where reality itself is often at question. Um, but I think um, being able to see, you know, fact from fiction is a key aspect of critical thinking skills. It's a key goal of them. Um, I will also say that reality does not bend its will to anyone. And so being aligned with reality is actually really important. And I, I like to give the example of there are three philosophers in front of a door and two of them say that it doesn't exist and then try to walk through it and boom, they hit their heads, right? Like the fact is majority opinion does not make something right. Like reality is reality. And you either align with it or you you basically end up suffering from not aligning with it. And so it's really important to have good critical thinking skills to align with the actual reality. Um, although I will say everyone has to use their own critical thinking skills and judgment to decide what is reality um, in this very complicated day and age. Um, and we'll talk about um, you know different skills that each of us can use to do that, um, not only in tonight's session, but but also in future subsequent sessions. We're going to have um, conversations about how to build our critical thinking skills, and we'll delve into some of the things that I touch on tonight in a lot more detail in the future sessions. Um, so 
that said, um, you know, aligning with reality really helps us be more successful in life, um, which increases happiness and decreases harm for yourself and those you can influence. So it is a really good thing to strive for, um, aligning with reality. Now, um, how do we acquire knowledge? Um, you know, trusted sources and authorities, although I would, uh, is one way, although I would always say don't trust blindly and um, trusting those that don't have a motive to lie and have a reputation for being honest is a, a good thing to do. Um, we'll discuss more about a vetting process for that next. And then number two is creating and learning from scientific experiments. Uh, they're pretty good at what they do and they can be peer reviewed. So you can have someone try to reproduce a scientific experiment if no one can reproduce it. Chances are good someone was making up the results, which is very possible. You can make up results of an experiment and write them down. Um, it, it is uh, unfortunately something that's been done more often than I would like to, to think. But when you start to have other people reproducing those experiments that are trying to challenge them and no one can reproduce them, then you kind of question the first guy. If people can reproduce them that didn't expect them to be reproducible, then you start to say, hey, wait, maybe this has legs. Um, we found out something very interesting in reincarnation event the other night when I was researching for it. Turns out there's a lot of peer-reviewed research that supports that reincarnation is real, which I didn't know until I researched that event. So fascinating stuff. If people want to read about it, there are actually articles about it. Um, so next is through the census, through our own sensory experience, um, we can acquire knowledge. So um, vetting purported facts, I really think that... Um, you know, a key aspect of critical thinking skills is to, as you take in new facts, understand the bias of the source that gives you those facts and um, see whether or not the, the facts or the purported facts actually support their bias. And if so, ask yourself whether or not there are any sources without that bias that can agree with that fact. And if not, I would be concerned about whether or not it's a real fact or whether or not it's fake news. And, um, you know, pay attention to which sources claim things that can't be agreed, that aren't agreeable by any sources without the same bias. A source that does that regularly is not a source to be trusted. And I would argue critical thinking skills, this is this is kind of an example of critical thinking skills in action. Um, sometimes an example is a good way to do it. I will talk about critical thinking skills in theory too uh, later in the presentation, but this is sort of uh, an example of critical thinking skills. And then if an unbiased source can agree with a surprising fact presented by a bias source, then it's more likely, uh, or cannot agree with, I meant to say, I, I got the phrasing wrong, um, then um, it's more likely that the source is lying. If an unbiased source will agree with a surprising fa fact, then it's more likely that the source is accurate and that surprising thing really is true. Although I found when I fact check things that surprised me, you know, from bias sources, most of the time those things turn out not to be true. Um, usually there aren't such big surprises. Uh, the things that shock us are often the things that are not real. Um, so um, the next goal of critical thinking for me is wisdom acquisition. Well, what is wisdom? Um, I like to say it's telling, you know, uh, a key aspect of critical thinking is to tell wisdom from folly. And so what is wisdom? Wisdom is about making better decisions. And the definition of wisdom actually um, says the quality or state of being wise, not very helpful. And then knowledge is what uh, knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action, uh, said, uh, I can't pronounce that, sagacity, sag sagacity, uh, discernment and insight. And then I thought long and hard about what constitutes, you know, good decision making. And what I came up with is the five intentions, which is to have the North Star be to be the best version of yourself, to seek truth and to be fair, and then to be transparent about who you are and what you believe to the extent that you trust someone to have an open mind towards new ideas that will help you be the best version of yourself, see truth and be fair, to hone your critical thinking skills so that you can better discern fact from fiction and wisdom from folly, and then uh, to increase happiness and decrease harm with that really clear picture of the world um, and, and uh, those, those honed critical thinking skills. And then lastly is an eagerness to give and receive love, um, which I would argue is sort of brings us to our higher self. Um, so that said, those are the five intentions of the Free Thinker Institute, which are kind of common values. And um, you know, for me, that that's you know the the number three in the middle there is what we're talking about tonight. But it's all in service of um, trying to make better decisions, which you know the five intentions are intended to help people do. So self knowledge, I think, is a key part of critical thinking because 
if you can't um if you can't have a solid foundation for your knowledge and wisdom you know then you know building a house on a on a you know building a house on sand is not a good idea right it's going to fall over and so you need to have knowledge of yourself to know your own biases and to know your own um like sort of what makes you tick right and a lot of people go through life without really evaluating their own um their own uh you know even like thinking about life goals and thinking about what type of personality type do they have and you know a, a lot of other things that um is self knowledge that we talk about in the free thinker institute membership and i would argue that a, a core basis of critical thinking is to know one's own biases and what, where one is coming from in life so that you know what to be um, aware of. Confirmation bias is when we, um, you know, only look for evidence that we're right rather than look for evidence of new truths. And everybody has confirmation bias. It's just a psychological phenomena. And without self-knowledge, it's hard to be as self-aware to realize when we are mired in confirmation bias. So being aware that we all have confirmation bias and actively seeking to combat it and knowing our own perspective, because remember I was saying we have to know that other sources of information are true. We also have to know that we are being honest with ourselves about you know what we're experiencing, what we're seeing, and that we're using our ability to reason to seek truth. Um, because um, and that, and that self knowledge really helps us in that. So I think that's a core part of critical thinking. Now, a lot of people, you know, in society don't think critically, and that's not a criticism on those people. Like I think we have a lot of good reasons for not thinking critically, and so I'm going to go through a bunch of them. You know, one is our education system teaches us to be followers, right? Our education system was created to create factory workers around the turn of the 20th century when factories were big and really the education system was meant to churn out factory workers that were order takers not leaders and corporations often you know are looking for order takers as well there are a small handful of people that are considered leaders but um you know we're we're not really you know most organizations are not teaching everyone to be a leader um, and so, you know, we are in society, both through our education system and our companies are often taught to be followers and that that's the behavior that's rewarded. There are also a lot of um, dogmatic perspectives on life that, you know, teach blind faith uh, rather than using reason. And I'm not against faith. Like, I think faith can be very helpful in many ways, but I also think that it's wise to use reason. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, a lot of us are taught as children to follow blindly to our, you know, our parents. And a lot of parents say, do what, you know, do this, right? And then when the child says, well, why do I have to do that? The answer is because I'm your parent, right? And to me, I've never given that answer to my kids. I always give them a reason for doing everything that I ask them to do, because I don't think me being an authority as their parent is the right reason. Like, I have to have a better reason than that in order to feel like I can tell my kids that they need to do something there's always a good reason for what I'm asking them to do. So I give it to them. Right. And so, but I think that a lot of parents um, were brought up that way where they were told, do what I say, because I'm the parent and I'm the authority. And so we're, we're all kind of naturally um, geared in this sort of followership uh, perspective. And I would argue that's a part of why fake news travels faster than real news, because people aren't thinking enough for themselves and questioning things enough. Um, although I would argue that even blind faith actually requires the person who believes in blind faith to choose using their own judgment to have blind faith in whatever they have blind faith in, right? Because they ultimately are exposed to other things, right? And they ultimately have to say, I'm going to keep my blind faith in whatever religion or philosophy. You know, some people have blind faith in science. I have an essay on determinism, which makes, I think, a pretty good argument that determinism is essentially blind faith in science at the same level that medieval man had in God. And so, um, you know, even scientists have blind faith. They just have blind faith in the laws of physics, you know, if they're determinist, being the sole determiner of uh, the future. But anyway, I'm digressing on free will. Sorry, I do that. Uh, <laughs> free will is one of my favorite topics. So, um, so um, we can, and I would argue, we should always apply our judgment to everything we should learn. Even if you have blind faith in 
that the Bible is the word of God, you know, um, and that everything that it says is true, um, I don't think we should necessarily trust blindly that our religious teachers are the right interpreters of the Bible. Because if you look at the Inquisition, the, the religious leaders at the time said that torturing people was the right way to save their souls. I think now, historically, we would recognize that was not the right way to save people's souls. But at the time, the religious followers just followed the, the church leaders blindly. I would argue if all of them had said, you know what, it doesn't feel right to torture people. And I would argue they knew that. Like, I think we all inherently know what's fair and what's unfair, at least in the extremes. And if more people had followed their own judgment and used their own critical thinking skills back in those days, there may never have been torture in the Inquisition because everyone would have said, no, it doesn't make sense to torture these people. And so I would argue that even if you have blind faith that the Bible is the word of God or that the Quran is the word of God or that the Bhagavad Gita is the word of God, whatever your religious book is, or whether you believe in science as the word of God, I would argue it always makes sense to apply your own judgment and critical thinking skills on everything you learn, both knowledge and wisdom, because you ultimately are the captain of your own ship. And as the captain of your own ship, you have to be able to be at peace with the decisions you make. And, you know, you're going to, you know, reap what you sow. Um, and I would argue that, you know, there are different ways that different religions talk about this. And, you know, um, you know, as karma or uh, you reap what you sow or, you know, all kinds of things, but you get what you put out, um, you get back what you put out. And I would argue that we ultimately all, if we're not aligned with reality, if we're not using our critical thinking skills well, then we're going to end up suffering for it ourselves. So we ultimately need to trust our own critical thinking skills. But to do that, we have to hone our critical thinking skills. And so that's what this series of events is going to be about. And we're going to be doing them over, you know, probably the remainder of the year, quite frankly, and maybe even beyond, because it's a super important topic, probably one of the most important ones, if not the most important one of the FTI. And so um, I'm really excited that we have two people that can help us um, in that effort that we met tonight. So I hope you'll both reach out to me about that. Um, another thing, um, you know, scientific dogma I, met, I touched on quickly is, um, but I'm going to go into a little more detail. Science will often um, say something is absolutely true, and science doesn't teach things with a degree of certainty. And for example, um, if we said that um, I think a more accurate perspective on the origins of the universe is we think that time began at the singularity, but we still haven't figured out how that came about and what existed before it. And so there's some chance that we may be wrong about that. I think an honest depiction of the origins of the universe would be stated as that. But that's not how scientists state it. They say the universe began, you know, time began at the, the beginning of the Big Bang and nothing so existed cool. before, but they can't logically explain how something came from nothing at the beginning of the Big Bang, you know, without entering God and scientists don't believe in God generally. So that's not going to be their answer. But if you read the arguments for this, which I highly encourage everyone to do, there are a lot of hand-waving arguments that don't make a lot of logical sense. And again, trust your own judgment. And again, I'm, you know, I have an alternative hypothesis. So I do have a, 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 um, a, a little bit of a, um, a, a quandary with that um, particular point. But I would just say that in general, science likes to come up with definitive answers without acknowledging where the hypothesis is strong and weak. And so there can be dogma in science as well. Now, science is great at, you know, when there's really clear evidence that's incontrovertible that refutes the prior stuff, um, science will adapt and change. And that's one of the things I love about it. I'm a trained scientist. I'm a computer scientist. But um, science... Um, there's a good book and I'm forgetting the name on it. Um, my father introduced me to it and it talks about how major paradigms in science only get revolutionized one generation at a time because the people who were the founders of it and the big believers of it have to die off in order for a new crop of people to come in and sort of say, we're open to something new. And so um, even science has its dogma. Um, and so I would just argue that through all walks of life, religion, science, spirituality, whatever you want to believe, learn to hone your critical thinking skills and learn to come to your own conclusions and learn to be really good at discerning fact from fiction and wisdom from folly. Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And, um, and so um, another thing is social pressure. Like when someone disagrees with the norms, 
Um, like probably a lot of you are thinking I'm crazy for questioning that time started the Big Bang right now, right? Like I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you are because that's generally considered an accepted norm. But that's why I say do your own research and look at what they say came before the Big Bang and see if it makes sense that time could have not existed in those paradigms. To me, it doesn't make sense. Um, but there's a lot of um, social negativity for anyone who stands out from the norm. Um, and and so I think there's a lot of social pressure to have people fall in line. There was a very interesting experiment I sat in on as an alum, um, Cornell Psych 101 class, um, and um, there was an experiment done where seven people looked at lines on a piece of paper. There were seven lines on a piece of paper, and the first person, and they were asked, like, are all these lines, like, aligned like do they all you know start and end at the same point and person number one said yes and person number two said yes and it went all the way through to person number seven they all said yes well it turns out the lines were not at all aligned and they were very obviously not aligned and the first six people were all part of the experiment but the seventh person didn't feel comfortable disagreeing with the other six who just agreed that all the lines were in line and so they just said that they were aligned because they didn't want to seem different and that shows you the power of peer pressure and how people are so afraid to stand out from the norm. This is in a, you know, just a, like a, someone knew they were in a scientific experiment and still didn't feel comfortable speaking their mind in that kind of situation, which tells you how strong peer pressure is for people to fall in line with the people around them. And that's why I'm, you know, very concerned about the amount of echo chambers that go on in the US, um, especially with fake news traveling faster than real news, because if people surround themselves with people who have the same misunderstanding, then other people who may not even have that misunderstanding will fall in line. And so I think it's really important that we be resilient to that and improve our critical thinking skills. Um, so another view is that um, I think critical thinking skills help us create models of the world to predict future possibilities. And, you know, this is like, you know, if you take an example of, um, you know, physics, right? Like Newtonian physics was a model of the world that was very useful and helped us in a lot of areas. But then with Einstein, we came up with a more advanced set of laws of physics that created a better model for the world. If you're a business owner, you may have a model for the world for how your business will function in the world. Well, coming up with good critical thinking skills enables us to create a model for how the world will work and how things will work in the world. And so I would argue that's another sort of thing that critical thinking skills enables us to do is to create predictive models, if you will. Um, and I don't mean just mathematically predictive models, but just being able to anticipate what someone's going to say and do is a predictive model in some regards. And so if you get to know some people really well and you know what they would do in a situation, that's a predictive model. And now, because of your relationship with that person, you have a good predictive model with that person. And so those things are what critical thinking skills, I think, enable us to do. Now, another aspect of critical thinking skills is formal logic. This is something that I only learned about when I was an exchange student in Spain, because the U.S. doesn't teach any formal logic. And I think it's a shame, like we should be. And so we will have a class on formal logic at some point in the Freethinker Institute, which I encourage you all to come to. And an example of formal logic is if I say, if all raspberries are red and I'm holding a raspberry, then what I'm holding is red. Seems pretty logical, right? Except here's the thing, not all raspberries are red. An unripe raspberry is still green, or it might even be a different color. And so the fact is formal logic holds with it a lot of power for reasoning and creating conclusions from a series of assumptions but you need to know that your assumptions are safe and that you're not committing any what are called logical fallacies. A fallacy is another thing that comes along with formal logic, and we'll do another event on fallacies because both of them probably deserve their own events. And so an example of a fallacy would be, um, this is an a, example of a fallacy is basically unsound reasoning is the, the, no, the common parlance for um, a fallacy or the common way of communicating a, a fallacy. And so an appeal to ignorance means, you know, here's an example of an appeal to ignorance. People have been trying for centuries to prove that God exists, but no one has been able to prove it. Therefore, God does not exist. That's basically saying, you know, because there's no evidence, it's not true. But actually, that's not a logical proof that God doesn't exist. Um, in fact, you can't prove that God doesn't exist. Even if God doesn't exist, you can't prove that unicorns don't exist. It's a logically impossible thing to prove that something doesn't exist. 
you can say, you know, a unicorn doesn't exist right in front of me on my desk. And so get more specific about that. But like, um, and these are the things that, um, you know, logical fallacies will make someone believe something, even though there's, uh, there's no sound reasoning to come to that conclusion. And so fallacies are very dangerous because they can be used by sort of slippery speakers to make you convinced of something that really isn't true and isn't on solid grounds, but it sounds so convincing, right? It sounds pretty convincing. Yeah, people have been trying so long to prove God exists, but no one's been able to, so he can't exist, right? But that's not actually sound reasoning. Um, so um, now I'm going to give the ChatGPT view of critical thinking skills, because for those that haven't used ChatGPT, I highly recommend it. It's great. Um, they talk about analysis, which is breaking down complex information into its component parts, the ability to identify patterns, relationships, and connections between different pieces of information. That's what I was talking about around models. I talk about that as um, you know, creating models uh, for future prediction. Evaluation is to assess credibility, relevance, and reliability to different sources of information and weigh the strengths and weaknesses of different arguments and perspectives. A lot of what I talked about tonight was about that. Um, inference is the ability to draw logical and reasonable conclusions from available evidence um, and to recognize and avoid common errors in reasoning and judgment. Um, next is interpretation, to make sense of complex data and information and identify key trends, themes, or implications. We did this in um, the uh, the um, event on global warming. Global warming is one of those things that, you know, I always, um, a lot of the sources that, uh, you know, that I heard, like, had good arguments on both sides of global warming. And so I finally, you know, spent the time to sit down and use my critical thinking skills to do the research. And I looked at, you um, you know, the the data and made sense of complex information and then summarize that into a pretty clear argument that, you know, since human history, you know, since Earth's formation, that the fastest that the Earth's temperature has ever increased um, prior to the last 200 years was one degree Fahrenheit in 260,000 years. Well, it turns out that it's gone up two degrees Fahrenheit in the last 200 years. And that made me pretty convinced that global warming seems like a human inspired thing, um, because that was a pretty incontrovertible um, set of data and a way of making sense of complex data and information to spot a key trend or theme by, you know, doing a comparative uh, study of uh, temperature increases over time, um, based on the arguments that I've heard from both people that were pro and against um, global warming. To be honest, before, before we had that event, I had never heard a good art counter argument to the, um, the, like the group that says that global warming isn't real had always said, well, temperature fluctuations are within normal norms of Earth's history. And it turns out that's actually not only true, we're in like the coldest 10 to 15% of Earth's history. So yes, like global warming is what it was originally called. Now it's called climate change. But we're in the cold side of Earth's history, not not the warm side. But we are rising so fast that you know, within a couple hundred years, we're going to be in in dangerous territory if we don't change things. So um, that was an example of interpretation um, and explanation is the ability to communicate complex ideas or concepts clearly and persuasively, which is what I tried to do in that event. You you guys that came to it can tell me if I did or not, and I just summarized it so you can tell me if I did here or not. Um, and to support one's argument and um, with relevant evidence and examples. So this is the chat GPT view of critical thinking. I think it's a very good one. I think it aligns with everything that I went through, but um, you know, is a very succinct way of putting it, um, maybe a little less prescriptive than I was getting, but you know, um, AI can't do everything yet. We still have jobs um, and there's a lot of benefit from AI. We should have another event on AI. So what happens when we don't get critical thinking right? Well, it results in a misunderstanding about the world if we are misusing critical thinking or you know not effectively using critical thinking on knowledge or facts about objective reality. And then the other thing we could misuse critical thinking on is about decisions that we make. And I would argue that decisions that we make should be you know geared towards increasing happiness and decreasing harm for the for ourselves and the people we can influence while keeping clearly aligned with truth, which I would argue is what helps us do that effectively. And so if we're not using critical thinking skills well, 
we have a misunderstanding about the world, which can create a, an unsolid foundation for our decision making. And then we end up either because of a misunderstanding about the world or because of poor decision making processes, make decisions that cause harm and reduce happiness when really we all know that it would be better to increase happiness than decrease harm. And so that's what happens when we don't get critical thinking right. Um, and that's the last slide. So now I'm about 30 minutes in. Um, and so hands, hands for everyone. So Dave, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett, and I very much uh, enjoyed your presentation. And I do my thinking uh, a lot of times by parallels. And this is a very dangerous time. I think you start off by saying, and I admire the library and your background. I, I grew, a, grew up a couple blocks from a public library, and I love libraries. But the thing of it is now, all the information, in all the libraries in the world is in my phone. Yeah. It's the internet. It's wonderful. But I think then it gets back to what you said in your first slide, facts versus fiction. So to me, the problem is truth. And, uh, you know, as a computer programmer, you can put about anything out there. Uh, I can say it's Tuesday, according to the New York Times. But where's the certification that it actually came from the New York Times? So the parallel I, I would like to draw is the introduction of electricity into our homes and appliances. Uh, those of a certain age will remember, but uh, used to be, you'd be afraid, well, you know, if I buy this, maybe I'll get shocked, maybe it'll burn down my home. There was a third party agency called Underwriters Laboratory that would test appliances. And if they passed their test, it got a little round label, I think yellow and red around the cord, to you know that this uh, appliance was approved by Underwriters Laboratory. And I think we need some way and I think you will agree as a program will probably have to be done by some kind of fancy in software. First, especially that this is identified as coming as AI. So I'm in a, another AI discussion group and it can look, you know, like I want five paragraphs, a biography of Thomas Jefferson and AI will kick it out, but you know, who knows whether it's true or not. But so uh, you need to know if it's AI, but then also you need a third party agency to certify that the truth, uh, you know, where the sources are, uh, that it's not confirmation bias, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's my two bits. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I would argue that it doesn't only have to be a third party agency. It needs to be, um, uh, it needs to be one that's unbiased and comes from a position where they don't benefit or, um, you know, there's no plus or minus to them lying. Actually, they, I should say that differently. There should be a big negative to them lying, <laughs> right? Like anyone in that third party, you know, organization that lies should end up with major consequences. And when there are no consequences to lying and people can get away with lying and serve their own interests, well, we find that lying is actually really common under yeah. those circumstances. And Unfortunately, a lot of the people who have bullhorns in today's world, which by the way, we all have bullhorns in today's world because of social media. So that's the big upending. And I think the big reason that misinformation travels faster than real news is that um, everybody has a voice and there's a great democratization in that giving everyone a voice that I love. But what it requires is that we all have the critical thinking skills to discern fact from fiction and wisdom from folly and we haven't been trained in those skills. And so right now we're like a child with a handgun. You know, we have this great powerful weapon, a huge bullhorn given to everybody in society without us having the skills of knowing how to handle that handgun. And so um, not to use guns as an example, because, <laughs> but, you know, hopefully everyone would agree a, a toddler shouldn't have a handgun. So um, I, I'm agreeing with you, Dave, and just adding my two cents. Does that make sense? Cool. Thank you for your comment. Really important one is that, and I, I think Dave, like if I'm channeling you right, the idea of having authorities is valuable. And I agree with you that it's valuable to have authorities, especially objective authorities. And that's what fact checkers are for. But then you get a lot of people saying all the fact checkers are biased. And then it's like, wait a minute, like, <laughs> you know, like how can everybody that's trying to be objective be biased? And and then you have to question if if you're saying something like all the fact checkers are biased, 
you have to check whether or not it's your confirmation bias saying that, and you would rather just be right than seek truth. And I would argue it should be more important for all of us to seek truth rather than to be right about our confirmation bias, because otherwise we get mired in our confirmation bias. Eleanor, uh, Eleonora, go ahead. Mm, yeah, I think, I don't know, I, I don't even, I'm not even sure if it's worth it to get excited about any information at the moment. Um, sometimes I'm listening to things and I'm thinking why people create this type of from information. So for instance, I would hear some news and then, and then I would ask myself, why? What is what purpose would it have on long term? And then I'm trying to imagine me speaking this information out loud. And then I kind of get this uh, sense of the feel of how the person must feel. Um, maybe angry or maybe neglected, maybe painful. I think at the moment we have a lot of people who have pain suffering and um i'm not even sure if one need to be upset at someone at the moment because people are just trying to figure out really what who they are and where they're standing at and um <laughs> the, the most funny thing i experienced is um my friend uh, was staying here with me and she says oh she's going to um um on a ride and I was like oh my god where is this and she's like yes we will go there we will scratch the eyes and we will fight off and I'm, and I'm thinking like I don't want this <laughs> you know, I don't even want to go anywhere I don't want to fight anything but she was so convinced and I was like where is this all hopefully not at my place or hopefully like not around me you know so people do have own realities and people live in their own kind of like head and there's seriously a physical place obviously where everyone can go and fight off whatever they want to you know for their rights but um may everyone get happy you know it's not like i'm uh, it's not my business so i think it's important to understand why people create this information and on long term when more people when this type of information gets attention of many people where is it all going what was the last sentence you said sorry it sounded when, like you cut off when certain information gets more attention so where is it all going basically sorry for my bad english um so where is this all going in terms of what um, consequences it has when more and more people attending certain information. Yeah. Um, so it's called basically movement. Yeah, but movements can be good and movements can be bad. And movements can be useless, movements can be useful, you know. I agree with you completely. And I would argue that when you see your friends that are angry about that, I would, I would urge everyone to when you're angry at someone you know go to that person and ask them why they believe whatever it is that you're angry about and do what we call listening to understand rather than getting angry at them and and clawing at their eyes say so why do you think that right just be inquisitive and it doesn't matter I, i've been in so many different um i have been at so many different uh let's say sites or groups yep. or people who believe in different things and I need to say everyone is angry. You know, if I go to group A, sure. they want to scratch someone. If I go to group B and I'm, I'm in this moment sitting there and they want to scratch someone. And then I go to group C and they're also angry. I was like, oh my God, everyone is so angry. Right. <laughs> everyone is angry. And, and it's the left angry at the right and the right angry at the left. And the middle gets caught in the middle. And, you know, I'm in the middle and the left is angry at me and the right is angry at me. So everyone's angry at me. So um i get it but what i would encourage is instead of being angry at people ask them why they think what they think do what we call listening to understand empathize with them and try to understand where they're coming from with authenticity like really try to get into their heads and, 
I don't want to listen to anyone anymore. I'm tired. <laughs> well, you may not have the energy, Eleonora, but when when you get the energy, I would encourage you to listen to them and understand where they're coming from. And if nothing else, encourage your friends who are angry to do that instead of being angry. Because being oh, angry. Oh no, I um I, I actually fired everyone, you know. So I don't I cleaned everything out around myself. I need new friends. Please feel welcome to be my friends. Well, I'm happy to be your friend. And if you join the Free Thinker Institute, that's part of what I was going to mention to you is that we're all about helping people figure out who they are and creating, you know, meaningful friendships that of people who want to seek truth and to be the best version of ourselves and to be fair. And if that sounds like a likable group of people, then cool. Like reach out, you know, Ellis is going to post information. I think she just did actually about membership of the FTI. And we would love for you to apply for membership and you know, make new friends that are more interested in seeking truth rather than being right, which a lot of the people that are angry, they just want to be right. And they want to be right about being angry. And that's not going to help anyone, right? What's going to help any, everyone is empathizing with other people, listening to understand and asking them thoughtful questions so that you can either understand where they're coming from or help them realize that they don't have good answers to the questions you're asking. And then they're going to come to the conclusion that they're wrong themselves. And that's how um, Daryl Davis is the black jazz musician that convinced hundreds of KKK members to no longer be racist. He just asked them thoughtful questions that helped them realize they didn't have a good reason to be racist. And when they came to the conclusion that they didn't have a good reason, they changed their minds. And so listening and asking questions is way more powerful than telling someone they're wrong. Telling someone they're wrong puts them on the defensive and makes you the enemy. Whereas asking them empathetic questions you know, is a much better approach in my opinion. So sorry to hear you had to fire all your friends, Eleanor, but you're not the only person I've heard say that, by the way, and there's a dearth of friendships in this country. And that's part of why we have FTI membership is to create more friendships in this country, but meaningful friendships, um, you know, uh, with people with common values. Mike, did you want to, um, I'm not sure if you were partying or if you wanted to make a comment on that, but you're next anyway, so uh, why don't I just let you speak? Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Mike and I'm a software uh, engineer working in Manhattan. And uh, I, I can tell you why everybody's angry today, because uh, things have turned into team sports. Uh, it's not left or right anymore. It's my team against your team. I'm going to support them no matter what they do, which is uh, I've been trying to highlight to people around me lately that, you know what, forget these people. Uh, look, look, uh, look out for yourself and what is good for your community and your family and all that. and like, for example, uh, support the people that would help you in that aspect. Don't just, you know, go ahead and vote this or that or the other just because you always done that. Uh, and and if you follow, the anger is, is the same as the anger in the sports arena, right? Yeah. And people end up fighting, like, you know, in the UK with the soccer or whatever. Uh, so, and and... The other thing I wanted to highlight is that the medium now is, has become the message and people have become too lazy to go find out the truth for themselves. I've been telling people, go Google it, you know, go Google it and read from multiple sources if it's true or not. But people hear it on this channel or the other channel or whatever news network they listen to. And just because they listen to it all their life, they take it as, as a fact. And I learned actually not to do that so i keep flipping the channels to trying to find that together and i don't have time to do all that so i actually stopped listening to news i also disconnected a little bit yeah. no i i have okay. disconnected from the news i still get it through friends and social media and i see news but i consciously don't spend a lot of time on the news mostly because the news is very alarmist that's you know they're they're there to sell eyeballs they're not there to tell the news anymore i i don't know what to say other than i just don't think that the news is there to inform objectively the way that it used to be um and um i don't find that it always talks about the most meaningful things going on in in the world um but i it, i hear you about that it's turned into a team sport and that's what i'm trying to help uh, combat against that's part of why I started the Freethinker Institute is to you know help us all realize we're on the same team we may have different beliefs but ultimately we have more in common with each other than we have to disagree about we can vote for different people for different reasons and that's fine and we can have different opinions about pro-life or pro-choice 
although we had a an event on abortion as well, which I would argue that um, there's you know there's a you know common ground to be found in that debate, even though that you might think there's not. Um, but I would argue that um, you know you're right that it has turned into a team sport and an us versus them and a blind followership, and that's why critical thinking is so important. Is that we can't give in to our emotions, right? When we give in to our emotions, we make bad decisions. And when we get angry at the others as being the wrong people and the enemy and the bad people, we're all human beings. And we all have more in common as human beings than we have separating us. And I think it's important to remember that. I think Abe wanted to jump in. Please, thank you. Keep an eye out on that, uh, Ellis. So keep keep doing that for me because I can't, I can't see it all the time. Uh I mean, don't you think we all go into a group think mentality? I mean, a good example would be, I'm from the Northeast and I went to Texas last week. My views were completely different from what the people whom I met in Texas. Like in terms of, uh, you know, guns. I mean, I when I look at guns, I don't see so much of shooting in the Northeast. But when you go South, they think it's their right. They talk about Second Amendment. They talk about Jesus and, you know, um, things about, you know, uh, anti-abortion views. And from my perspective, I look at them as, you know, I've got this bias also. I, I know where they come from. And it's very difficult for me to accept it. What part is difficult for you to accept? You mean the, help me understand that. It's difficult for me to accept, you know, uh, it's like, oh, it's a simple thing. I mean, you know, when you have all these guns and shooting every day, I mean, something has to be done. About oh, you mean it. the guns part is difficult for you to accept, like having people be able to have access to guns, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And we have become laughing stock around the world. And, yeah. you know, and you find people still talking about having these uh, AK-40, AK-15s, which they use in a war. And right. we don't need it. And it's difficult to convince them that, you know, you don't need those type of guns. Right. And yeah. uh, what I find is like a groupthink <laughs> mentality. I just think, why is it that they don't understand? See that I think that that is part of the groupthink mentality is why don't they understand? They would also argue why don't you understand, right, Abe? Why don't you understand that we're hunters and we need these guns to go hunting? And and I and I'm I'm not claiming that I can understand why they think they need a like a semi-automatic or you know rifle that needs to be turned into an automatic rifle by mail order, because that's you know that's a little bit harder to understand. Although. If you if you look at and you try to channel, I guess I I will tr maybe I I do have an answer to that. If you try to channel our founding fathers and why there was a right to bear arms, it was to have a militia so that if there was you know I I would argue that a, a significant reason was so that if there was ever a tyrannical government that the militias you know the state militias could over overturn a central government that was authoritarian. And so the idea of a right to bear arms is sort of about being able to defend freedom and democracy. And so there, there's a good argument to be made for that. Um, and it's a nuanced subject that's not, I don't think we should just simply say the, the gun owners are wrong. I don't think it's that simple. You know, there should be no guns and we should ban guns in America, I don't think is the answer. And we actually had a, a topic, like an event on this topic um, uh, another night earlier this year and it, it's a complicated subject that I think needs to be handled with finesse, especially considering how strongly a lot of Americans believe in their guns. Um, and many of them will tell you, you can take it out of my cold dead hands. Um, and you know, you're not gonna convince someone who says something like that by telling them they're wrong. We're gonna, you know, if we're gonna convince them of anything, it's gonna be by listening to them to understand their perspective better. And I did my best to channel it. Although if there are gun owners here that are um, strong advocates and felt like I got it wrong, um, feel free to correct me and, and speak your mind. Mike, did you want to respond to that? Um, yes, yeah, sir. I'm talking a bit too much tonight. Okay. But, that's uh, I'm, I'm actually a, a gun owner myself. There you uh, go. And uh, I'm a very peaceful guy. I don't even want to hunt uh, animals because I think it's, I just can't accept it. You have a right to kill another 
living thing. Um, but I, I do have guns because I like the idea of them. I go to my range and, and, and use them and everything is fine. What I find uh, alarming is that these shootings come in waves. And I'm not sure what causes people randomly around. And, and they don't just happen in, in the U.S. They happen in Canada. They happen in New Zealand. They happen everywhere. And I don't look at the tool that they use to kill other people because they use all kinds of tools. But I, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, but I can't figure it out why these happen in waves. Uh, and I have to link it to unhappiness, maybe, in the population. I have no idea, really. I'm just... But the media has become inflammatory, uh, including the media company I work for. Uh, when you listen to some reporting, it's always the, the language they use to almost be designed to inflame the other side. Yeah. Oh, look at these politicians. They, they pass this. They want to kill you know babies or grandmas or things like that. Right? And that inflames the other side that believes in this particular media uh, source. So... Yeah, I, I understand, and I and I I hear about a shooting, and I say, who goes around shooting people? I mean, why? Why would you do that? Right. Uh, I don't understand that. I hope someone can explain it to me. But it's not the yeah. guns, because if they don't have them, they're gonna have a truck, they're gonna have a knife, they're gonna have a bomb or right. whatever. Right? And that's why I think that attacking guns is the wrong way to attack it, which is what we talked about on our event on guns. And I don't want to digress too much on it. I want to sort of try to answer your question as best I can, Mike, from like, you know, our conversation that night, but I would argue that there's a dearth of friendships. And so there are a lot of lonely people in this country and world, quite frankly, and there's a lot of untreated mental health problems, people who are, you know, lonely, miserable, bullied, you know, and if I've read about a number of these people who committed school shootings, and this is the situation, you know, it was their colleagues and coworkers made fun of them day after day. Their their fellow students made fun of them day after day, and they had no outlet, and they didn't get proper treatment and help to deal with the situation they were dealing with. And eventually, they snapped and said, "I'm just going to kill as many people as I can." And that that has been the ones that I researched in detail. That's been the story. And so when I presented on gun guns, I said, you know, for me, what we should be doing is focusing on mental health help and getting the mental health help that people need so that we we don't have people who are miserable and unhappy and so angry that they just wanna kill people as a way of venting for their own misery. Um, and, and so again, I don't wanna digress on um, gun ownership specifically, but to say that I think that empathizing with people is a better approach to being angry at people, don't be angry at gun owners, try to understand where they're coming from and try to look for a different, you know, a different root cause than maybe the one that the media is telling us is the the issue. The media sells eyeballs by um, getting us um, addicted to watching the media, and that's how they make money, right? And unfortunately, um, doing that, getting people emotional, is going to get people coming back and watching every day because people get addicted to that kind of emotional response. And that's why our only rule is to remain polite because it keeps us calm, cool, and collected and thinking more reasonably rather than getting emotional. And people have gotten emotional in these events, but we usually try to calm them down and usually they manage. So um, that said, um, uh, thank you, Mike, for your comments. Really appreciate it. Um, you weren't the gun owner I was hoping for, but it's okay, you're a gun owner. It was a start. <laughs> so I was hoping for the one that said we need an AR-17. And if we have any of those, I would welcome you to raise your hand and Tell me if I was wrong about my channeling uh, the perspective. So, um, so uh, Will, go ahead. I don't think you're the gun owner with the AR, the automatic rifle. For me. Go ahead, Will. Oh, yeah. No, I don't have a rifle. <laughs> Didn't think so, Will. Just handguns. Um, anyway, uh, Garrett, what I was going to say was that uh, when you were speaking, I don't want to digress too much. I only put my hand up because there was no nobody else. It's okay. Had the hand up, so I don't want to digress. But when you were speaking about the inception of time, I'm not sure if you were um, defending the current theory or casting doubt on it. I was trying to cast a little bit of doubt in saying that in order for time to begin, there had to be a first moment in time, but in order mm. for there to be a first moment in time, how did that 
first moment in time even come about. Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. I don't think science has come up with a good explanation for how the first moment in time came about. And I'm okay with that, by the way. I would just say that what scientists generally don't do is they don't go, we have a good explanation for everything starting from the Big Bang going forward. We don't really have a great explanation for how that first moment in time came about. So if someone's got a better theory there, we're all ears, right? Like scientists don't, they don't give those caveats. They give definitive answers and they try to give definitive answers, even when sometimes they don't make any sense, because we all naturally want to have an answer. And I would I would caution everybody that when you don't have an answer, it's OK to not have an answer. It's OK to say, I don't know, and then to inquire and to try to learn more. And so I would argue that science falls prey to not acknowledging what it doesn't know and, you know, as well as religion and, you know, both both like religion, science, spirituality, all paradigms do that. And all I would say is part of critical thinking is acknowledging how confident we are in something and being able to acknowledge what we don't know and being honest about it and being open to new truths that will teach us more about those things. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, well, what I was going to say anyway was that um, irrespective of, you know, whether you were defending it or casting doubt on it, it is an example of how vehemently <clears throat> scientists defend their theories and um which is demonstrative of of this element of human nature i think where we do it in all aspects whether it's the you know the new york yankees are better than the boston red sox a ford's better than a than a toyota we we vehemently defend our scaffolding of the world and it is at the <clears throat> at the detriment of critical thinking and um i've had a, a huge argument with a, a friend of mine where we nearly sort of wouldn't speak anymore because I was saying we'll never be able to figure it out. I've probably had that discussion with you to some degree. I think it's beyond human comprehension. And then other people start jumping up and down and saying, no, it's not. But it's an example of even scientists become really do become dog dogmatic that we can work everything out. Right. And, and, and I think it's really fascinating that aspect of human nature. It's like our ego somehow is entwined. It in, is reasoning to such a degree that we will forego critical thinking for the sake of defending our scaffolding as a friend put it to me recently we've all got this scaffolding we've got a sort of an existential angst and we defend our view of the world by keeping our scaffolding well buttressed and god forbid anybody uh take out one of our planks of of reasoning but i've and this, I, this is why i don't want to digress i've come up with a, a new theory about um the big bang and that uh, and may, now may not be the time to quickly share it but it'll take about 30 seconds if you're ready go ahead share it thank you well neil degrasse tyson and this isn't on the subject of critical thinking although it could be perhaps incorporated into the discussion i'm not sure but neil degrasse tyson was recently asked um, what keeps him awake at night? Things about physics and the universe. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't know everything anyway. He's just like a pop, pop physicist that brings it to the masses. You know, he's not necessarily particularly creative or um, a genius. However, he said that the thing that keeps him awake is that the known universe, which is 70 billion light years wide, uh, which we can observe through like the James Webb um, Deep Space Telescope and the Hubble Telescope before that may not be the only. So if you think of that like a bubble, like say a giant ball, we can see that 70 billion light years wide with trillions of galaxies in it. But there could be other of those spheres with galaxies in them that we'll never see because everything's expanded so much. Now, if you take that aspect that there are things we cannot see, in the celestial sphere um, and you combine that with what the common theory now is relating to this thing with the emergence of time that something emerged from pure utter pristine nothingness or alternatively it existed infinitely without first cause if pressed on the issue most physicists will say it's more reasonable to assume that energy existed infinitely without first cause so what I'm saying is if the Big Bang that caused our um, known universe to be 70 billion light years wide was not a single um, isolated event, 
as per Neil deGrasse Tyson saying, there could be other spheres out there which we can't see with trillions of galaxies in them. And if perhaps, uh, so energy existed infinitely without first cause, our Big Bang is not local, isolated, independent event. Therefore, if energy existed infinitely prior to this moment in so-called time, then I propose that Big Bangs may have occurred infinitely, regressively, before now. There may have been infinite Big Bangs, and therefore there are infinite other spheres of universes with the same physical um, properties as our universe has. However, there's just tr it, it, infinite amounts of them. And my final point, I've said I'll keep it under 30 seconds, sorry about that. Um, final point is therefore, but like the, with, as for extraterrestrial beings, they say if there was an extraterrestrial being in our known universe, it could only be 13 billion years old because that's how long since the Big Bang. However, if there have been infinite Big Bangs, there could be infinite uh, time for civilizations to have emerged. So there may be civilizations which are in fact one trillion years old or as, you know, infinitely old. So there's a lot of things there. Sorry to ramble on, but I'm just kind of glad I got that off my chest. And um, I don't, as I said, it's somewhat of a come to my. Some... <laughs> I thought you were. At, I thought you were at my event on the origins of the universe because I presented exactly that theory there. What with the infinite big bangs? Yeah. Oh, was I at that? I don't know if you, I guess you weren't there. Or you, I mean, maybe you were there. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't, to be honest, I don't listen much to, to, I'm usually doing something in the background. I don't even know what meetings I'm at half the time. Well, maybe but, you yeah. learn about it like uh, subliminally. Uh, well, but yeah, that was exactly, that's exactly my essay that I wrote. Did on you the copyright? Did, is that your intellectual property, Garrett? I'm yeah. going to quickly register it. Where do it we is. go? I, I came up stuff. with it in 2017, my friend. Oh, so no, I, no, I think I have, a, I have a number on it before <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, as far as I know. So, yeah, nah, well, I thought of that uh, about four days ago or the week before last. Yeah, when I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about the bubbles. Anyway, it's interesting stuff. And yeah. Um, it's, yeah, fascinating. It is in interesting, fascinating. And I I would argue it's a more honest and hopeful view of the universe. So I'm glad to hear you saying it because I want more people to say it um, because I think it's a realistic view of the universe. And it's one that's actually much more hopeful than what scientists give us, which is heat death or big crunch where humanity eventually ends no matter what we do. And we're all fated to die. We're all going to die, right? Well, actually it turns out if if, we're right you know we can actually dance along the edges of universes infinitely and you know be you know elevated beings at, at some point that are capable of a whole heck of a lot more than we are now as our uh modern ape uh current current form so that said um Ginny why don't you go next thanks thanks Will for sharing that I'm sorry did you want to say something else Will well, just it gives you know it gives extra weight to this thing of perhaps we've been created by something else which i don't actually believe if i had to bet the farm on it i would say no but it does give more weight to that theory that perhaps we've been created by something that's like a hundred thousand billion years old not just 13 billion years old yeah so i would actually i would go so far as to say i have a pretty good logical argument that our free will itself comes from a higher power because how else can non-deterministic free will come about other than from something that has non-deterministic free will. And so I would argue that it, you're right, um, indirectly, not that our life, that life as we know it came about from that, but that free will came about from that. But that's another story and we're digressing from critical thinking skills, but we'd love to chat with you about it in the online community if you want, Will. Ginny, why don't you go ahead if we if we can get back to critical thinking? <laughs> Sorry, we digress uh, a little. You can go off on a tangent too if you well, want. Well, yeah, um, I may be going off slightly on the ta that's tangent, fine, that's but you fine. said We're earlier. All friends here, so it's okay. <laughs> we are our friends here. So, Garrett, you said earlier, I believe, that most scientists think whatever discoveries they've made, um, they think is a definitive um, answer to whatever they've been. Whether they, uh, they, they, they do. They Whether do? they think it that way or not, they, they generally present it as definitive truth. Yeah, yeah. And I've been saying for years and years and years 
nothing is definitive when it comes to science. So um, yeah, that's all I want to say. I, I love it, Jenny. And I think that it, you know, um, I think it was Socrates said, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. And he didn't mean that he knows nothing, right? Like we hopefully all realize Socrates was probably one of the smartest men alive, if not the smartest man alive. He didn't mean that he knew nothing. He meant he always has an open mind that he might be wrong about what he currently believes. And that's why he had the smartest mind of his time, because he was always open to being wrong. And he was always learning by asking thoughtful questions of other people. And you learn way more by asking thoughtful questions of other people than you do by restating your current beliefs. And so, you know, the only thing I know is that I know nothing is basically a healthy argument for skepticism of everything that we currently believe and always being open to new truths, which is part of the second intention, which is open mindedness. So, you know, I'm with you, Jenny, like, I think. Yeah, and, and that's that, what philosophers are supposed to do, right? And we are here for philosophizing and we're philosophers. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're, uh, we're you know, okay. uh, but, but when it comes to um, an example, for example, that I keep thinking of when it comes to science definitive science, you know, for the longest time, they kept saying cholesterol, bad for you, cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. Well, come to find out it's a sugar that is a killer. Oh, I, I've I actually, yeah. I made this comment the last time, last week too, Garrett, and I think you actually said, oh, I do like, I do like sweets. <laughs> I do. And I, I eat too much sugar. And, you know, don't tell my dad that I eat so much sugar. I, he already knows. Um, because he's, he's very into health and keeps telling me eat less sugar. And it is like, you know, it is unhealthy. And you're right that sugar is is a, a very unhealthy thing. And there are certain sugars that are more unhealthy than others. I forget the one that's in like Coca-Cola, not to, um, you know, but like all like major soft drinks have the same um, sugar in it. And if someone knows it, just raise your hand. And um, what is it? Corn syrup. Uh, no, it's not corn syrup. It's uh, fructose. Um, fructose, yeah. Yeah, it, it is corn syrup, but it's fructose um, is the the specific sugar that's really, really harmful for you. So highly recommend everybody avoid fructose like the plague. If you look up the health impacts of fructose, it's really bad, much worse than typical sugar. Um, but yeah, sugar uh, sugar had a really good lobby. Um, and but so did, 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 uh, is, is there fructose in cereal like... Um you know, children's cereal. Uh, you have to look it up, but if you look at the ingredients, it has to be on there. So if it doesn't say fructose, then I don't think it's in cereal. I think it's like a, a, a liquid thing, but I could be wrong. Okay. All right. I diverged. Sorry about that. Okay. No worries. Um, Stephen, how are you? Good to see you. You're still on mute. No worries. Glasses. Yeah. There we go. Now we can hear uh, yeah, and on the same, I thought that was an excellent example where a uh, a scientific paradigm is defended as a dogma until people realize that maybe they were wrong. Uh, because further research, I think there was a uh, a Senate committee uh, uh, found that uh, there were a number of harmful things in in the in the diet uh, that were causing cholesterol and one of it, especially sugar uh possibly ch cholesterol but the sugar lobby as you said you know created this dogma and then the the, the medical community just kept spreading the the, the pyramid uh, and now there's a much more uh, nuanced understanding uh the same thing happened there was a, a u.s senator harry reed from nevada was he was retiring but he he put he put a clause yeah, in the defense right, budget. you must tell us what you know about the the uh, uh, the uh, flying saucers? Because my constituents, regardless of what the, the the scientific community says, and regardless of what the Defense Department says, we keep seeing these things. We keep seeing the lights. So did John Lennon. So did many many individuals. So did President uh, uh, Carter. People say there's something out there. And we don't know what it is. Please tell us at least what you know. And but the but the dogma was, if you say there's a UFO, you're crazy. Yeah, no, that's a really and, good point. And I'm sorry. The, I can I finish? Off. Go ahead. Finish. Uh, and then you go ahead. Sorry, I didn't. What I happened was that the the report finally came out, and they said, well, it turns out lots of very credible, very experienced, very respected. Um, pilots 
uh, uh, fighter pilots, uh, commercial pilots, uh, observers on the ground. We saw things and then about 98% we could explain. Yes, they were balloons or something else. But then that 2%, there's a lot and a lot of them, we can't explain what they are. And in fact, it, it's better. This is like Socratic reasoning. I don't know what I don't know is wisdom. Yeah. And it turns out they don't know and they admit that they don't know. And uh, all they did was being military, they gave it a new acronym. It's not UFOs anymore. It's Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon or a UAP. UAP. <laughs> so people could now look up and say, God damn, there's a UAP out there. Let's go tell the newspapers. Yeah. So we're we're actually in a better place of wisdom, but people are not freaking out because we don't know what it is. It's a mystery and mysteries are fun. Mysteries are interesting. Um, but I'll say this one thing, which we could say uh, it, philosophically, which is if something is watching you, everyone should be on their best behavior. I appreciate that. Being comment. observed, be on good behavior. I agree. I agree with you completely, and I would, and that's why I argue not only for um, same life karma, which is almost incontrovertible, but for metaphysical karma, I have a good logical argument for it as well. And actually, the the research showing that um, reincarnation is almost certainly true makes a pretty good argument. Like, if reincarnation is true, well, it's hard to imagine that there's not some process for you know, how how does a soul get reincarnated? And it's hard to imagine that anything responsible for that would not be like rewarding people who do good in this life and, you know, punishing, not punishing, but sort of reducing the influence is the way that I like to put it. Anyone that does bad things in this life so that you can't cause as much harm, much harm in the next life. And um, the other um, the other thing, I, I think your point about UFOs was great. Like I had not heard of that new name for UFOs. Um, but the argument that um, I made, um, and I forget when I when I wrote this essay, um, but was on, um, uh, let me see if, uh, no, I can't find it. So, um, but basically the idea is the universe is unfathomably large. To think that we are the absolutely only sentient life in the entire known universe means that we are this one point in like trillions upon trillions of like, huge amounts of galaxies and planets and you know of just immense like what's the chance that we are the only single instance of any life and if we're not the only single instance then there's got to be other life in the known universe and if there's other life to think that we are the highest life seems unfathomable too like are we literally the epitome of all life that could have possibly existed since the beginning of the big bang and if Neil deGrasse Tyson and me and Will are all right, the universe is actually infinitely old and has always existed. And therefore, there's actually probably infinite types of life in the universe, not just us, but infinite types of life in the universe, because there are infinite opportunities for life. And infinity is hard to get your mind around. But, um, you know, I would argue that's more likely the reality than than uh, that people are crazy for believing in UFOs. I think you have to be crazy to not believe in UFOs. Although I don't know if like, you know, the, the US government actually released um, films of UFOs that, you know, I watched one of those videos and I was like, oh, yeah, like if the government is releasing this and can't explain it themselves. And these are like, you know, fighter jet pilots that are flying about as fast as things that we know can fly. And they're saying that that thing flew like you know, 50 times faster than anything that they've ever seen. That's a little hard to fathom. So maybe these things are flying around. I, I used to say, I don't know if they're flying around. But once I saw that video, I was like, oh, maybe they are flying around. But um, I don't know if UFOs fly around in uh, in in spaceships or what. But um, but anyway, um, to think that there's no other life in the universe seems a little bit unfathomable to me. So, Will, um, thank you, Stephen, for your comments. Good to see you. Thanks, Garrett. Maybe we could have a UFO day, night, one day. We should. Um, we should. Like, yeah. I think that's a great idea. Um, I'll, I just want to list. I was just introducing Daniel because he he's having trouble putting his hand up. He said in the chat. So, but um, yeah. And I'll just say there are one trillion planets just in the Milky Way alone. 
they've estimated one trillion planets in our galaxy. Yeah. Thank you. I was yeah, I gave the numbers a little bit off, but I was estimating. <laughs> so well, there's 200 billion stars. So if they've each got an average of three planets, there's there's um, 600 billion. If they've if they've each got 10 planets like our um, solar system has, there's uh, two trillion right there. So if we go with five, there's one trillion right there. Poor yeah. old Daniel's having a hard time getting to speak. Uh, is Daniel have his hand up? Yeah, Daniel he wants to go next. He can't, he can't get the hand up. So he's oh, I'm just sorry, Daniel, go ahead. You're, uh, we can't hear you, though. You're not on mute, but we can't hear you. Try connecting to audio. He's disappeared altogether, has he? No, there he is. He went off video, but um, hopefully oh, yeah. he'll, he, I think he's working on the audio, so. There but, we go. Can you, Are you able to hear me now? You can. Go yeah. ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I appreciate your guys' patience. Um, so the only reason why I turned off my video at this point is that I've gotten comments before that when I leave my video on, for some reason, I begin to lag pretty often. So there are moments where like all of a sudden I'll just freeze up or pause. So no that's the reason why I have my video off right now. Um, so uh, I'll try and uh, be brief. And I guess um, I'm going to kind of approach this from a rather cynical point of view. So <laughs> forgive me for that. Um, and I only love the opportunity to outline my thoughts a little more clearly. But so essentially, uh, I'm reminded of a quote by Nietzsche when he says something to the uh, effect of, we say it is explanation, but it is only in description that we are in advance of the older stages of knowledge and science. We describe better, we explain just as little as our predecessors. And what, what that sort of means for me, I guess, my major takeaway from that is that um, in some way, I'm rather deeply skeptical about claims to knowledge or claims to enlightenment and wisdom and things of that sort. I value all those things deeply. I should put that out there right now. And um, we've already mentioned a few figures that have tremendously influenced my own thoughts and feelings and um, life. In fact, Socrates, when I was introduced to uh, philosophy and Plato and Socrates specifically, um, when I was about 17, um, that propelled uh, my life in a direction completely um, differently than the one that I was expecting to go to. I had, I had changed my life overnight. Well, and so anyway, so back to this. So I guess kind of where, like, so in part, why do I think that and how does it relate to critical thinking is, so I think it's important to re reference or to bring back the points that we've already made, which is that we are fallacious or biased creatures. I think bias might be more accurate here. And I don't think that that's an accident. I don't think necessarily that we are making these, that we have these biases as a kind of cognitive mistake, if you want to refer to it in that way. Instead, I'd, I'd argue that we have biases because we need to. I think we are, I think we have biases because that's in some way, the way that we're biologically constituted. Um, so for example, I'm remember, I don't know what the name of this phenomenon is, but there is this um, image you can see where there will be uh, two objects, say two squares, um, and they're going to be two different colors, gray and white, if I'm not mistaken. And then you'll put in, and then what you'll do is imagine if you have two vertical lines next to one another, and one line is colored from white at the top, and then it goes gray at the bottom. And then you have another, and then you have a small square on the left hand side of this line, and you start that square at the top. It will look similar to that to the top uh, color, which would be white. And as you move that square down, it will look more similar to the gray coloration as you go down um, the sort of the the bar, if you will. I'm not explain that very well, but what that kind of means in part is that we're not actually the the color of the square is the same thing as the rest of the image on the right hand side. It's all it's all the same color, but the way we perceive the object is differently depending on the surrounding objects that it's by. So we, when we look at objects, we don't even actually see the way that things look 
as they really are, but that are being more or less interpreted through sensory stimuli and through, um, let's say you can say mental models or schemas that our uh, minds are constituted by to serve as models of what we experience in the world. And so that we're not really seeing an accurate representation of reality. Instead, what we're seeing is more or less a kind of um, idiosyncratic worldview that then we have to parse out and try to get a better picture of. And part of the way we do that is through observation and experimentation and through engaging in dialect with other individuals so that they can also correct when we're making mistakes. Now, the thing that's kind of funny, this is, and then I'll just kind of end it at this point and just to kind of bring it full circle is that it's funny because when we're engaging in these dialogues though, and we're having these exchanges, it does feel as though we're kind of coming to know something that that we're correcting mistakes that we've made and that we're coming to closer to the truth or to knowledge. And the question is, how do we know that that is what we are attaining? Maybe, maybe it's, it's that we're, we're sort of more or less emotional you know, biased creatures that are kind of just in the world as it is trying to navigate a foreign land in a sense, because I mean, we just kind of pop up one day. We're just sort of, here in a society at a time when we've when we had no decision whatsoever to um, to choose what society or time that we've kind of been born into and that we're these creatures, just human beings who are pre-built with certain uh, physiological structures. And then here we are, we're just kind of engaging with each other. It almost feels like maybe in some way, part of what critical thinking is, is a kind of pragmatic enterprise where we're trying to come up with better understandings of the world, but we're also just trying to navigate um, this territory that we find ourselves living in. We're social beings who have to interact with each other, cooperate, trying to keep away cheaters and what would be people who would take advantage of us. And we're living in a large culture and a government that's helping to provide a kind of structure where people can live freely and to have rights and to practice what they want to practice. And then each of us, you know, um, leisure is the mother of philosophy. So if it wasn't for the fact that we had this time to ourselves, we probably wouldn't be pondering some of the deeper questions of life. Like what is the meaning of it all? And like, you know, what do I want to do with myself? We're only able to do such a thing because well, in large part, we're not being threatened constantly by some kind of ravenous animal that would take advantage, that would eat us. This is the moment we stepped outside of our house. We have all of that available to us. So I, I don't know. I, I, I guess it's that I don't really, I think critical thinking is valuable and we should try and use it and develop it and cultivate it as much as we can. But it also just feels like, like it's hard to know where it's taking us and if there's any kind of ultimate reality, which is helping us to describe or to capture or to really get at. Maybe it's, maybe where there's no, no, nothing out there for us to discover or to know it's, we're just, this is just the way that we, that, well, we have to, the way that we're kind of, determined to behave in some sense just because that's the that's the way that we are it's the way that reality is constituted the reality is constant but i'm contradicting myself in a sense and that's that's kind of the beauty and the weirdness of this all i guess i'm not quite hopefully hopefully um i've explained myself just well enough to have made some points though to be honest you know reflecting on it i probably said next to nothing but that's just how i think so thank you for the time appreciate that yeah, so you said a lot of stuff. Uh, we try. I want to try to encourage everyone to stick to one one comment, one topic at a time, because I have a lot to cover. So confirmation bias is there for a reason. I agree. We covered that in our um confirm our confirmation bias evening. So I won't go into it in detail, but I'll say I agree with you that it's there for a reason. It has a purpose. I just would argue that it often in the modern world causes more harm than good, um, than the good that it does. Um, and then um, I agree with you that we don't always see things like absolutely with the way that they objectively are. We have misunderstandings all the time and we just create mental models to understand the world. But I hope we would agree that seeing things through our senses and learning through reason are useful tools and that our senses do help us when we see, as you pointed out, a 360 degree view and look at things from different perspectives. They help us get a more clear view on objective reality so that we can learn more knowledge about the objective about the objective reality that we live in and you know when you say we're coming closer to truth as a group through these conversations i would argue we are um 
when you compare us to the people who someone was mentioning earlier are trying to go claw other people's eyes out because they're emotionally angry, those people are not coming closer to the truth. They're just giving in to their emotions, which I would argue doesn't help them in their pursuit of truth. I think we all have an inherent desire to seek truth. And those people are really defending truth with violence um, in some respects. And I think we all inherently will even use violence to defend truth. It's just that in a modern world, it's not necessary anymore. And so our emotions kind of lead us down the wrong path by trying to tempt us into using violence to find truth. Nowadays, like because we do have the protection of, um, you know, at least I think all of us in this uh, event are in you know, countries with stable governments that have rule of law. And so we're in a place where we we can have the stability to be able to, you know, make a living for ourselves and think about philosophical subjects, which I'm, you know, blessed to be able to do. Um, and so, um, and I, I hope we all feel like we are. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, I think um, we are slowly and carefully learning more about objective reality as as the world moves forward. And Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, does a good job of saying that we live in the healthiest, wealthiest, safest world that humanity has ever known, which says we're moving in the right direction overall. But we do have a lot of risks. And I will say we should have another event on this, which is that um, you know we're getting more power in the hands of more people. And eventually someone who's you know uh, destructive in nature will get the ability to destroy the world and they may just be having a bad day, but decide to press that big red button and suddenly we're all gone, right? And if we're not careful, I mean, that's the obvious joking is extreme, but like there's a point at which much earlier than that, we cross a line where, you know, some crazy person that can amount enough power can, you know, cause a nuclear war war and like we we've gotten close to that we, you know we've gotten close to nuclear war with russia multiple times since nu nuclear weapons were created and it was only you know from people mm -hmm. actually defying authority that we were saved from nuclear holocaust multiple times so um there's a lot a lot to unpack in what you said and um i want to let um is it ella ella so so i want to let her go uh i think it's uh you're on mute, Ella. But thanks for your thank comments, Daniel. Go thank ahead. you. Thanks. Yes, I would caution against malignment of emotion as not holding truth and knowing. Viktor Frankl talked about the importance of anger to drive uh, social justice inclinations that raging against what is harmful is a really critical activator. It, it, it generates action. Anger can generate action, necessary action. There are other efforts we see in the world uh, in revolution against inhumane actions and how important these moments have been for to human history. And uh, voting on the right side of history. It, of course, if people hold humanitarian objectives as important, and that's a value judgment too. So I would just caution against maligning emotion as as its own as not being its own intelligence. And again, it's um, activation towards towards a more humane, civilized existence. I think also um, we often hear emotions like anger. Uh, I, I think of veterans, for instance, coming into an office outraged by an issue around care, for instance. And they could be emoting so they're not heard, but it doesn't mean that the kernel of truth that they're emoting about isn't truth, it doesn't have weight and value. Um, and so it may be massaging the message so that the rest of the world who is not victim to that um, experience of harm can hear it because they're the ones with the power often. But, um, but again, I would just 
I think of the many ways in which emotions tell the truth. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ellen. And I wasn't meaning to say that emotions are bad or have no use. Like, I think there's a lot of benefits to emotions. In fact, um, psychological studies show that human beings who feel no emotions can't make decisions. They can't even choose what to eat for breakfast. Like they literally can't decide Cheerios or cornflakes. So we need some emotions to be able to take action. Um, and, and without that, um, you know, like, we, we're almost helpless. And so you're right that emotions can create action. All I'm suggesting, and it's a stoic approach, is uh, stoic like, um, as in actually stoicism, not uh, stoic as in ignore your emotions, which is a common misunderstanding of the, the actual ancient Greek philosophy. I'm talking about the ancient Greek philosophy, which, you know, when I channeled it and sort of interpreted it myself, my way of dealing with emotions is to understand the emotion, to look at it objectively, to accept the, uh, what I'm feeling and then look for the root cause of my emotions. And if it's a positive emotion that I'm feeling, understand what created that positive emotion and cultivate the root causes of that positive emotion. If it's a negative emotion that I'm feeling, you know, try to understand what caused that negative emotion and try to prevent the root causes of me feeling that negative emotion. And in basically dealing with the root causes of the emotion rather than giving in to the emotional desire, um, I think we end up with better outcomes. And all I would say is that, um, you know, um, you know, doing that is a better way rather than doing what your emotions compel you to do immediately, which as someone mentioned earlier, they wanted to scratch other people's eyes out. That, you know, that to me is not the right answer. What's the right answer is what I said in the beginning of the event, which is, Ask them why they think what they think, right? Yes, be angry, be upset, but calm down long enough to understand and empathize with the person you're angry at, to listen to them and understand their perspective rather than to yell at them and scream at them and tell them that they're wrong and, um, you know, that they're a bad person, right? All Like the ancient Greeks said, every man thinks he's a good man, and they only talked about men then, but it's really every person thinks they're a good person, it's really only when we have misunderstandings that someone ends up doing something that the rest of us see as bad. And so I would argue that everybody thinks that they're doing the right thing. It's just about what is the right thing and seeing the truth more clearly that get people in trouble and end up having people do the wrong thing. I don't think anyone gets up and says, I just wanna be the worst human being that I can. I am born to be bad and that that's how they were born from the beginning of their life. If someone gets to that mindset, it was through lots of misunderstandings along the way that they got there. Um, Ellis, go ahead. Hi, I was going to say it's um, a little bit after 8.30, so if anyone hasn't spoken yet, now's a good time to raise your hand. Uh, and just to let you all know, next week we're discussing, is having kids good, bad, or neutral? We're going to talk about the decline in population. Uh, and the week after that, uh, we're going to be talking about the education system. Uh, so we hope you all uh, RSVP for those events. Great. Thanks, Alice. Uh, Will, go ahead. Thanks, Garrett. Well, at the risk of sounding unctuous, I just wanted to say how much work you put in, how greatly appreciated it is. And I think we should all acknowledge that just what a wonderful job you do. And I sound like I'm being a bit fawning and unctuous saying that, but it's brilliant stuff. And um, if I'll they come it, regularly, it, well, they'll know you give me a hard time just as much. So I appreciate it. <laughs> so, well, you need you need agitators sometimes, don't you? To of move course. Forward. Like, it's great. I love it. You know, we all, we're all here to seek truth, right? And I am too. And if I only wanted people that agreed with me, then I wouldn't be seeking truth. I want people that say what's right and what's wrong. And I want us to do that together as a group. And we'll all help each other seek truth more effectively if we collaborate on it. So and it's only by looking for people who disagree with us that um, we can we can get a better understanding of the world, as uh, uh, Daniel said, where we look at things from a 360 degree perspective. So, um, but thank you for your comments, Will. I do put a lot of, uh, of effort into these, and so I appreciate the comment. And it's such a good thing, you know, I think to like, it's such a good concept that you've introduced to try and listen to other people's views because like I should teach that really at school, try and see where they're coming from. 
um, would be would make the world such a better place. Yeah, excellent, excellent stuff. Yeah, I it's so it. important to listen. Like we we really need more listeners in this world. I, I like the saying we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we talk. It should be more than that because there are so many other people in this world. And the truth is, we learn nothing by restating our beliefs or telling people why we're right. We only learn when we listen to other people with an open mind towards seeking truth. And so, you know, we're not learning by telling other people they're wrong. We're learning by listening to other people with an open mind. So, you know, listening is like a, a, a really important skill that I hope we can all sort of take away from tonight. If we take away anything, it's listen, listen, yeah, listen, listen. Listen to everything they've got to say and then tell them why they're, why they're blatantly wrong. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, give it a go. Jokes give aside, go. listen to everything yeah. they say and then ask them thoughtful questions to like mm. dig down to the root causes. And we'll we'll talk about this in one of our um our conversations on critical thinking. Is for me, what it's about is digging down to someone's axioms, the things that they just assume are true because they're not logically provable. They're just things that are, have to be assumptions. They're so based that they're the core assumptions. If you can get someone down to their core assumptions and all the logic that they use to build up from that, you've truly understood their perspective. If you're not there, you're just delving on the surface, right? Saying, you know, pro-life or pro-choice is a surface level discussion. You know, if you start to talk about, well, when does life become important to you? That becomes like a, a level below the surface, right? When When is life meaningful? At what point, what is the moment in time that life becomes meaningful to you as a person? And, you know, we had that conversation on uh, the topic on abortion. And so the listening becomes key is to, like, understand each person's perspective and why they came to the conclusions they did. And and that's why, you know, we have, you know, most of our sessions on the Freethinker Institute events are about, you know, open conversation. It's, you know, usually more than half um, conversation and less about presentation because we should all be listening to each other. And sure, I tried to present stuff that I hope was helpful, and I hope people learned from it. Um, I would always, I always love to know if people learned anything from the presentation. So, if anyone did, I would love comments in the chat if you learned anything from the presentation about critical thinking skills. Um, but um, you know, I, I do, um, I do think that the listening to each other is, you know, sometimes the most fun and valuable part. Yeah, it can come to compromises too. Yeah. And you don't have to agree. That's the thing. Like we've gotten afraid to like people, people don't like to agree to disagree anymore. And I would argue if you've both understood each other's perspective and you just have different fundamental assumptions, then it's okay to agree to disagree. Right. And we should be okay with that. Like we don't have to agree on everything and we can still be friends with people we disagree with. That's right. And often, often, you know, you disagree with someone and that you see it a lot and they, the, the walls go up and they never sort of communicate again. It happens a lot. But and it, it does. A measure of a friendship too, I've found, even with family members, we have a big debate or argument, but you still talk, you know, a day or two later, you get back to it. It's a measure of a friendship too. Can be. It is. No, it's a great point. And like, I, I think that um, it's important to, um, it's important to, be able to um, have different uh, different opinions and beliefs from people we know, because what tends to happen is if we cut off every relationship where we have a disagreement with some, with someone else, I mean, how many people do we have 100% of alignment philosophically with? Like almost no one has 100% philosophical alignment with someone else. If you're both being authentic and you're both sharing your true opinions, you're gonna have disagreements with people and so it becomes critical to having positive relationships to be able to, you know, listen and understand each other, but also be able to agree to disagree and be able to still be at peace with that. And it's a, a key to having positive relationships is to be able to agree, agree to disagree without having it hurt the relationship. As long as there's not a betrayal of trust, then it's fine to agree to disagree. Like you don't have to agree on all areas with all people. And we won't. Mm. Yep, well said. Anyone if, you want, if you're wanting to wind up now, Garrett, or not, I'm not, you know, I don't want to keep prolonging things if you've gone over time. So 
Yeah, we're not over time. We still have 15 minutes left, but I'm also open to ending early if people don't have other questions. So um, it might be the first time we did that, but I don't know. Like, was it also clear? Like, if people not have other questions or comments on critical thinking skills? I think uh, maybe I, people aren't putting their hands up because they realize that uh, we personally have no cognitive biases. It's everyone else is the problem. <laughs> We all have cognitive biases, <laughs> so except me, obviously. Oh yeah, right. Except except us, right? Except us, so, yeah. Right. It's everyone else that's the problem, not me. That, that's a typical uh, typical story. Abe, you had your hand up earlier, and then you were just speaking up. You want to? Do you want to say something? Yeah, I think we lose our critical skill thinking skills as we grow up. Like you look at a child, he asks you the most basic questions: why, why, why? And after a certain stage it becomes like, you know, you're asking me stupid questions. Like I still remember reading this biography of uh, Einstein and which he says, like when everybody else grew up, I was still a child. Yeah. And uh, that was a very uh, interesting thing. I mean, he would walk around asking basic questions or for that matter, even Isaac Newton, just imagine an apple falling on his head and you asking, like, why did the apple fall on my head? Why didn't it go the other way? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Abe. I think children are so curious. My kids are six and they ask a lot of questions and I, I love it. Um, and I look stuff up. You know, now I look stuff up on ChatGPT, quite frankly, because it's even faster than than Google. And so, um, you know, I uh, sometimes I do Google images if they want pictures of stuff. But like, um, you know, I, I do think we're all born with an inherent curiosity, desire to seek truth, to be good people, and to be fair. I think we all recognize fairness from unfairness. You know, inherently, it's only through misunderstandings that we accumulate throughout our lives that we do things that are unfair, quite frankly, or, or by not listening to our conscience, we do things that are unfair. Um, and so I agree with you, Abe. I think we're born um, with a lot of good reasoning skills, and it's it's learned behavior to have corruption in reasoning, but it can also be learned behavior to have clarity in reasoning. And that's what these this series is about that we're kicking off tonight is it's about clarity and thinking and clarity and reasoning and critical thinking is like is all about that is clarity and thinking and reasoning so that we can learn to rely on our own judgment really with a high degree of certainty, but always an openness to being fallible. Uh, I was reading about this thing in, about evolution. I mean, you know, the evolution, the rest of the world was teaching evolution in school. And I think we started teaching evolution somewhere in 1972, somewhere in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court got involved and said, you know, you can't be teaching evolution it's the wrong theory right and then they had the monkey trials <laughs> they bought this whole thing and said i think in 1996 i think they had this monkey trial somewhere at delaware saying that you know uh evolution is wrong we can't be teaching that we didn't come from apes and all that stuff I, I, you know i'm i was quite surprised even in 1996 people couldn't believe in this theory of evolution and then comes nine uh, last year in which the one who won the Nobel Prize in uh, medicine was somebody who came up to the theory of evolution. And we still are here debating about evolution and whether it should be taught in schools. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and actually, it brings me back to an event we had, I think it was last year, um, on how science is compatible with spirituality and religion, if you look at it the right way which is essentially that once science has a really solid opinion of something, you believe science because religion and spirituality are what we call, what I called inconsistent philosophies, whereas science is a consistent philosophy. So science is more solid, but it's slower moving, but science is constantly evolving, whereas spirituality and religion are a great place to go when there's not a good scientific answer. When there's a really good, solid scientific answer, and a lot of people do this just intuitively. And they're spiritual people or religious people, but they still are scientists and they can make sense of both of it. And the way that I think they do it is exactly what I propose, which is when science has a really good answer for something, trust science. But when science is in doubt or you know 
you know, there is not a clear answer about, you know, uh, an, uh, you know, from science on something, then be open to spiritual, religious, philosophical um, beliefs. And I would argue that um, if my essay on free will is right, which the, the essay I linked to um, about um, uh, coping with the death of a loved one is the one on reincarnation that DLJ was asking for. Um, it it was uh, without going into details. It's just named differently, but that is the the essay that you were looking for on reincarnation. Um, is that um, shoot? I lost my train of thought. Um, let me just let let Susan go because we're getting getting late in the night, and I must be getting tired. So, Susan, why don't you go ahead and and then we'll go to Ella. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you, Garrett. No, I wanted to uh, ask you how to handle um, anger, you see, during critical thinking. You know that, uh, you know, it, injustice, it's not right, for example, um, uh, foreclosure. You know that the people that have the listing on the sheriff's sale, they are in some kind of trouble. They're behind in their mortgage, right? So there are people with money coming in and, you know, they wanted to buy their house. So that means the people are going to be on the street, you see, and then they continue to do that. They 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 advertise the, the house without your consent. They sell your a part of your house without you being there. You was in the hospital. You were sick. You were in jail. You were not there. And they just sell part of the tax that you were not able to pay, right? And for the public. And they invest in that. But I have a friend in Philadelphia. He's got a, a partner that asking him to go and buy houses and then flip over and make a profit, right? He said, no, I rather, because he understand the, the, the problem of homelessness. In, in, in our country. So I am so angry about that because I think uh, my friend de uh, declined that. My friend said that, no, I will invest in something else. You know, I mean, people need to invest their money. They want to make money, right? But only other people, unfortunate event, only other people down and out, uh, you see. So how do I handle that? How, how does a, a critical thinking will help me? I mean, how can I think critically, okay? How, how can I ask him in my normal voice, right? So this is complicated, what? Susan. Let me try to answer as quickly as I can. Um, yeah. First of all, as far as how to handle handle anger, I would look yeah. for the root causes of what's making you angry and then separate what's in your control from what's out of your control. And part of this is about creating mental models. You know, in your case, you know, you had a long period of time where you were, you know, trying to pay the bills. And the mental yeah. model that I would have recommended back then would have been, if I don't pay my bills, then I'm not gonna be able to maintain my home. And therefore yeah. I need to you know, find a job and do anything and everything I can within my control to find a job ASAP so that I can continue to pay my bills. But that's hindsight, right? But now looking back in hindsight, that might make a lot of sense. But now where you are, you have to look at what you can do that's in your control now. And, you know, look at, you know, what can you do to make, you know, the future as positive as possible. And that's all, you know, all you can do is, you know, I like to say, uh, I come up with 50 sayings, I think a lot of you guys know, one is do your best and accept the rest. So look at what you can do now to make the best of the situation you're in, do your best, and then accept where you land, but make sure you've tried your best to, to make the most out of the situation you have. So all I would say is look at the root causes of what's making you angry and try to handle those root causes rather than doing what anger may make you want to do because giving into like anger's natural inclination of action is usually the wrong answer. And that's all I was saying when I was, I wasn't meaning to malalign emotions in general, but just to say that the emotional response might, is very often not the oh. best response to do like, um, you know, if someone says like, you know, I'm going to hold on to my guns with my cold dead hands and I get angry at them and say, you're supporting, you know, child uh, murders around the country. That's not the right answer, right? That's like shooting back at them and hitting them hard, you know, with an yeah. accusation that, you know, probably they don't really believe that. What I should do is say, well, why is that so important to you? And so, Again, just not giving in to the emotional desire, but to look at the root causes of the emotions and what can you do in your control mm -hmm. to make make your future better. And we can talk more about that offline. Yeah. 
question, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. I have one more question. Uh, 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 yeah, if you Garrett. don't mind, just raise your uh, hand and let's let Ella let's let Ella go next, if if you could, and then raise right. your hand and then we'll we'll have you go right after Ella. So, oh, I'm okay to I'm okay to defer to her if she, if she was going to speak anyway. If this ties to her, I'm okay to wait. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Susan. Yeah, just one question: uh, Is there a difference between collecting a debt and foreclosure a house? Because you know this debt is the real property tax, and they put a, they sell it to the public, and the public have a right to lean on my house. It's the law. It's a, a law in the state. So I wanted to know rule of law, right? How many such rule of law there is? Because that is against rule of law. I am, you know, I don't have enough income. I don't pay. Not like I'm sitting on a pile of crap and I evade the tax. That's different. But they allow the people to lean on your house. Susan, Collecting the debt, Susan, I owe the IRS. Susan, if you don't pay your taxes, you you do yes. get you do get in trouble. So. And you you do yes. lose your property if you don't pay your property tax. So that that is actually a law. What kind of law is that? That is kind of inhumane. You know, I explained my financial situation, right? I I was in uh in Susan, prison. Susan, I, I don't want to I don't want to digress on that subject. Um, yeah. Like tonight, we can talk about it offline if you want. But um, yeah, you know, yes. it, it is it is a law, and you can you can look it up. But um, we can talk about it more offline. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Go ahead, Ella. Um, so may I actually make one response to the conversation that just happened? Sure. Before I, okay. So, and I think I forgot my original comment, but I'll get to it. It'll come back. Um, I would also consider other options, for instance, understanding the systemic impact that people with privilege of, of income will have more leverage than those without is important and maybe collect connecting with other people in similar situations, maybe housing advocates, maybe there are other advocates because when one is a single person trying to critically think through a situation like that, when there's a systemic oppression, it's really hard to have any sense of agency, I think for a lot of people and they may not know all the, all the options so I would connect with agencies or organizations, organizing, maybe community organizing, if that can be found to, to also problem solve. Because I, I think one of the fallacies is that we, we know everything or we have that kind of control and um, really there's a whole bigger system that knows a lot more than us. So anything that can help generate answers um, that we may not be aware of or just to know that we don't have the answers and try to suss out what what avenues there might be to problem solve that we may not be aware of. Because a lot of times also people are in these, we, we act like we're individuals and uh, or in individual situations when we really, um, it's a collective issue. So, um, and the divide and conquer experience is that, uh, you know, we have to deal with all of these hardships alone or we're left dealing with them alone when there could be more strength in, in connecting with others who share that experience and may have wisdom getting through it. And, and then the other question is like the idea of um, get a job, make some money and pay it off and do the best you can also has a certain amount of privilege to it. Um, if someone is disabled, if someone is elderly, a, a lot of people displaced are elderly who, who can't get a second job physically can't wouldn't be hired if they could and so um, there's a, often a lot of um, privilege embedded in in who can make critically like, I guess a lot of privilege in who has the um, efficacy to maintain uh, Balanced emotions, I suppose, is one way to put it. Um, when you're in an oppressed or, or hurt situation, when you're in a victim status, because it's actually victim status, like you just have less leverage, then you may be more. One may be more reactive, and so I think just honoring that is important. And and again, connecting with, like connecting with 
others who understand that experience and where that can be validated, because I think often we're going to get feedback from others that, that our experience is not valid and that we're weak or that we um, maybe deserve what happens. And this is the economy, this is capitalism, all of that messaging. And it's just important, I think, for us to, for any of us who are in that situation, and all of us will be at some point, I imagine, uh, unless someone is really lucky, um, everyone's going to be in a position of not having leverage. And so just connecting with what the kernel of truth is in that anger is really important or whatever emotion is coming up that may not be palatable to those with power around us. So thanks. Yeah, no, I think great points, Ella. I think, um, you know, Susan, I hope you were listening carefully because I do think looking for, you know, not for profits. And I think you've been in touch with some last we talked about you were um, in touch with a lot of resources to try to help you in your situation. Um, and Ella, I know Susan pretty well for, for some time now. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do think that she is, you know, or like was capable of getting a job, but if she felt like she was not, then being on disability is another option. And, you know, I didn't think about it until recently, but another option would be selling the house, um, before, before you go into default, but now it's too late for that too. So, but like in, in hindsight, like selling the house and then downsizing to a smaller place would have been another potential avenue. But again, that's no longer in your control. So, um, you know, we're past that point. But I think Ella had a lot of good suggestions and, and um, things to consider. Um, there are a lot of resources available to people who need help, and you should definitely avail yourself of them. Um, and, um, and I know you have to a large degree, but there's probably more that you can, you can look for. Um, and so, um, that said, I do want to kind of close out cause it's nine o'clock. Um, and I've been up since very early. So, um, I, uh, am that this is our end time. And so I do like to honor that as well. So I do want to encourage everyone to come back next week. Um, we will be talking about um, whether having kids is good, bad, or neutral. There are people who are antinatalists that think we should not have kids, pronatalists that think we should have kids, or some people that say it's neutral. And we'll we'll have a conversation about that. And then the week after that, we'll talk about the education system. And the week after that, we'll talk about prisons, whether they're best used for punishment or rehabilitation. Um, that'll be a more global discussion, uh, comparing and contrasting different parts of, uh, you know, different um, systems of prison, uh, prison systems, um, in the world. So, um, Ella, did you have another, uh, thing that you wanted to say before we close out? Or was your hand up from before? I'm sorry. It was up from before. Okay. No problem. So I just want to thank everybody for the great conversation, really interesting comments, um, questions, and, uh, you know, I always enjoy these. would love to see people chatting in the online community between these events on Tuesday evenings. And we'd love to uh, see a lot of you back next week. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, and uh, feedback is always welcome. I'm hoping that we'll send out a survey, although we don't always do it. Um, hopefully we will. And uh, we would love your feedback so that we can keep improving events. Thanks a lot, everybody. And hope you have a great night. Thank Ellie. Thank Ellie. Thanks, uh, Garrett. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.